station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We are ready for the event. JSC PAO, this is Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is JSC PAO. How do you hear me? JSC PAO, we hear you loud and clear. Likewise, Don. A lot of questions from reporters here at uh, JSC and on our phone bridge. So we'll start off with Robert Perlman. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com and Space.com. Um, the three of you look great inside the Dragon. I wonder if you could describe your surroundings a little bit, and um, would you feel comfortable riding up in one of those in a, uh, on a future mission? Well, uh, I, I spent quite a bit of time poking around in here this morning just looking at the engineering and the layout, and I'm very pleased. It's, it looks like it carries about as much cargo as I could put in my pickup truck, and it's uh, roomier than a Soyuz, so flying up in a, a human-rated Dragon is uh, not going to be an issue. And. Uh there was a great deal of excitement down here watching uh, the berthing yesterday, the grapple and berthing. Can you describe the, um, the sense uh, aboard the space station? Did you uh, appreciate or did you have a sense of, hist of the history that was being made uh, as you brought Dragon on board the uh, space station? What uh, we were pretty much focused on on the, the operational aspect of getting Dragon, and and I know uh, same thing when you go out for a spacewalk, and and uh, a lot of folks think, wow, isn't it this really neat? But but we're so focused on making sure we get the job done and making sure we get it done safely, and and these uh, highly operational tasks, it, it's it's not really time to sit back and, and philosophize on what happens. Now, after the fact, then you can sit around and, and think about what happened. But, but during the event, it, it's all business. This is Philip Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com. This is for Don. You ended up doing the grapple yesterday on a night pass, and I think you said on the space to ground yesterday that all the robot arm lights were out. How challenging was the nighttime grapple for you? Uh, actually, there's enough stray light reflecting from station, and with Dragon being uh, snow white, the, the visibility was, was uh, uh, quite nice. And I would not have uh, gone in and done the grapple if I couldn't have seen what I was doing. Um, the, the visibility was good from the point of view of there weren't any shadows cast, uh, which makes looking at the grapple fixture and uh, the grapple fixture target uh, easy to do. If if we would have had all the lights from the arm on, I, I'm, I think the lighting might have actually been worse in terms of casting shadows and, and making things a little harder to see. And then, is there any robotics uh, upcoming this uh, this week before you do the unbirth? Uh, no robotics involving the crew. As as you are aware, uh, the the robotic arm can be operated from the ground, and uh, there's a lot of routine tasks that the that the flight controllers on the ground do with the arm, and this uh, saves crew time so that we can concentrate on doing our payload uh, uh, scientific experiments and payload operations up here, and and during. The time that Dragon is docked, uh, they've they've already walked. They're planning to walk the arm off, and they're they're going to uh, uh, translate the mobile trans the, the the mobile transporter, and they're going to be doing a number of of uh, robotic operations, and everything will be put back to where it needs to be uh, by the time uh, we do the unbirth and the release of Dragon. This is Douglas Robertson for NPR. Um, this is a question for Andrew Kuipers. Uh, you posted a picture of you in a can of salmon uh, certified sustainable by the Marine Stewardship Council. Uh, why are MSC issued sustainably fish certification and sustainable fishing so important that you would talk about it from space? Yes, uh, well, from space, uh, we, we all realize how, how limited and uh, fragile our planet is. 
and uh, to uh, to have uh, sustainable use of all the resources of our planet is very important and this can be with uh, with uh, with wood from uh, from the tropical forest but also uh, with fishing it looks like a huge planet with a lot of ocean but we also know that uh, fish species are endangered uh, because of uh, of overfishing uh, so sustainable fishing is uh, is very important for our planet and uh, I care a lot about this planet and I hope to uh, to give it on to future generations who can also then enjoy uh, the resource of our planet. And uh, that's uh, the reason why I think this uh, is, uh, is a good thing. Let's uh, be careful with what we have. Did the MSC ask you to uh, mention the sustainable fishing certification? Well, nobody asked me uh, to uh, to do this. Is, uh, this is... Uh, uh, something that I care about myself and uh, and for the, this uh, this planet, so it has uh, nothing to do with any uh, uh, company or whatsoever. Go ahead. So there's no uh, relationship uh, underwriting or financial with the MSC. That's that's affirmative. That's affirmative. I've, I I am uh, uh, an ESA astronaut. Uh, I'm also uh, uh, say uh, uh, goodwill ambassador uh, for the World Wildlife Fund. We had uh, we had an event uh, here on board uh, on board for the 50 year celebration uh, of that. Uh, but there is uh, in such no link with any company or any uh, commercial activity. So this is uh, this is pure. Uh, my interest to keep uh, sustainable uh, fishery and, and other sustainable efforts uh, to, uh, to keep this planet uh, in a good shape for, uh, for the future generations. Station, we're going to take questions now from our phone bridge, and we'll start off from Sophie Garrett from Sky News. Hello from Sky News in London. Astronauts on board the International Space Station have been spending the day unpacking the latest batch of supplies. The unmanned cargo craft, which docked yesterday, is the first privately owned vessel to service the station and marks the beginning of a new era in space ex exploration. Well, hopefully, we can now go live to space and speak to three of the astronauts on board. Just be aware, I think there is quite a long delay on this. That isn't surprising. Uh, good afternoon to you, gentlemen. Great to talk to you live on Sky News. Now, tell us, touch and go as to whether this spacecraft would reach the station. Describe for us what it's like inside, and uh, what are you most looking forward to getting your hands on? Well, uh, when when Dragon came up and 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 it, it flies in formation near space station, and then we reach out with a robotic arm and snare it, and then we berth it to one of our docking ports, and and then it takes a while to get it opened up, and and we just opened it up this morning, and it's packed with supplies, and we're still in the process of unpacking. Uh, of, of unloading the Dragon, and then we'll, we'll load uh, more supplies in for a return to Earth. Okay, we're going to press ahead to Stephen Clark, spaceflightnow.com. Stephen? Hi, thanks for the time, guys. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, I, I guess, uh, first of all, uh, if one of, you, one of you can discuss the importance of uh, Dragon to the space station. We've heard a lot about the commercial aspect of this mission, but what does this mean uh, for operations on ISS? Uh, a Dragon is one of several ways we can get supplies up to space station. And, and in addition to bringing crews up and down in Soyuz now, uh, we need to bring supplies up, and, uh, up, and, uh, up to space station for our use. And then we need to be able to dispose of our trash. And more important, we need to be able to bring some of the scientific research uh, experimental samples back down to Earth. And with the retirement of the shuttle, we've had very limited capability to do this. And one of the unique capabilities that Dragon offers is a way to get significant payload back down from space station. 
Okay, next is Charles Atkinson from examiner.com. But they say that Good morning, Charles Atkinson, examiner.com. For Don, can you describe for me Dragon Supply unloading? Um, and is there enough time on your timeline to unload and then load up during the next four days? The way that. Uh, uh, actually, uh, we're going to have plenty of time to get Dragon unloaded and then get it loaded back up. We've already pre-staged uh, numerous bags to, for returning to Earth, so, so most of the things that we're planning to pack into Dragon have, have already been packed, so to speak, and we just have to move them into Dragon and strap them in. And the, the payload going out, uh, there, there's about as much stuff in here as I could put in the back of my pickup truck, and I, I don't think there'll be any uh, issue with uh, the three of us working and getting this thing unloaded over the next few days. We're going on to Marsha Dunn of the Associated Press. Marsha? Yes, I'm here. I'm hoping you gentlemen can hear me. Uh, Dr. Pettit, for you and your crewmates, the heat of the moment is over. Yesterday was a success. Can you philosophize for me, please, right now, on the historical significance of what you took part in yesterday? Uh, uh, so you're asking for a philosophical answer as if I might happen to have one in my hip pocket. Uh, let's see. Uh, we all remember the completion of the uh, Transcontinental Railroad, which opened up the frontier, the western frontier of the United States. And it was uh, celebrated or commemorated by pounding in a golden spike. And, and this is kind of the equivalent of the golden spike. Uh, and one other interesting detail, nobody remembers who pounded that golden spike in. The important thing is to remember that the railroad was completed and was now open for use to help uh, settle the western frontier. Next up, we'll talk to James Dean from Florida today. James? Thank you very much. Joe Acaba, I'd like to hear your first impressions of Dragon and does its performance so far give you, or, and this could, could be asked to any of the other crewmates, more, more confidence about the potential for vehicles like Dragon to one day fly you and your crewmates? Well, I was very fortunate to get up here in time for the arrival of Dragon and Don and Andre and the rest of the team had a great plan, so I was able to help where I could. And so in observing kind of as that third person, it, it was just phenomenal to, to watch the Dragon approach the space station and see these guys do their job in grappling it and now attaching it to the space station. And I have a lot of confidence in our future. This is a great first step to move us forward um, now with the commercialization of this. And like Don had said earlier, um, I think we would feel very comfortable in a human rated vehicle um, just like this one. Next up, Linda Martell, Planetary Science Research. Good morning. Hello, everyone, and congratulations to you all on station and on planet. Um, my question is for Don Pettit. During your inspections yesterday of the outside of the Dragon capsule, you found no micrometeorite damage. So my question is, um, what would the micrometeorite, micrometeorite impacts look like, and what were you looking for, and if you had seen micrometeorite impact damage, how, how would that have changed the procedures for birthing or today's hatch opening? Uh, we were, uh, micrometeorites, when they impact aluminum structure, make a little crater. It almost looks like the impact crater that you see uh, uh, east of, uh, of uh, Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, it, it, it looks like a little meteor crater, maybe a, a millimeter, maybe two or three millimeters in diameter. And, and uh, these craters make sharp edges, and if they're on mating surfaces for pressure seals, they can prevent uh, getting a good pressure seal. And what we inspected yesterday with our binoculars were the mating seals that mate to the bottom uh, flange surface on node two here and, and make the pressure 
seal between the inside of Dragon and the inside of Space Station and, and keep, keep the Space Station air from leaking out into space. And, and we specifically looked at the, these sealing surfaces to make sure that there weren't any micrometeorite damage. Next, we have Jason Parr from Wired Magazine. Uh, I have a comment, uh, question for Don Pettit. I was curious, as the Dragon was approaching and performing some of its maneuvers yesterday, what were some of the thoughts going through your head as the team had to troubleshoot some of the issues that uh, arose that were unplanned? And lastly, uh, what you felt like for the, the final uh, attachment with the arm? Did you feel there was a lot of pressure on yourself? This whole new commercial space uh, endeavor came down to you connecting to, uh, to Dragon. Uh, uh, we, we were pretty much focused on just getting our task done, and again, there's there's no time to philosophize when you're right in the middle of a, a critical operation like this. I I would like to say that the success or failure of this specific mission neither uh, confirms or uh, 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 negates the viability of commercial space flight. Commercial space flight will blossom due to its own merits and, and doesn't really hinge on one mission. It, it, hinges on, it will hinge on the viability of launching many missions over a long period of time and being able to provide useful uh, commercial goods and services uh, in the, the low Earth orbit arena. Next, we have Ken Kramer, Spaceflight Magazine. Hi, thank you for taking my question, and congratulations on a great job. Um, I was wondering, there's three of you in there right now. Do you have any plan to uh, have the whole crew in there, all six? Would you take any pictures? Uh, how easily would you fit? And how easily can you imagine that uh, Dragon would be converted into a, a crewed vehicle? Thank you. Well, I think we've already had all six people in here for a, for a real brief period of time. We haven't taken any pictures, and it's not there's not enough room in here to hold a barn dance. But for transportation of crew up and down through Earth's atmosphere and and into space, which is a rather short period of time, there there's plenty of room in here for the envisioned crews. And we'll wrap up with Irene Klotz from Reuters. Thanks, Rob. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Go ahead, Irene. Oh, great. Thanks. Um, I wanted to know, um, Don, if there was uh, anything in your goodie bags. Um, SpaceX sent you guys anything up? And also, um, how important it is to uh, be able to uh, clean out a big load of stuff um, in, in uh, Dragon, uh, which, of course, the station hasn't had that capability since the last shuttle flight. Thanks very much. Uh, we have have not had a chance to do uh, unloading of Dragon yet. We just opened up the hatch, and the unloading is scheduled for Monday. And so uh, uh, we heard that there might be a little crew care package in here with some goodies in it, and uh, we we don't know what they're going to be. And and it's kind of fun to keep those as a surprise, uh, just because it, it's nice to get a surprise every once in a while from Mother Earth. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you all. Thank you to all participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.